in chapter 19, we're going to take a look at the respiratory system. We're going to look here in the first half at the components and inspiration, and then we'll move on to expiration and some other things in part two. Uh, this picture here up at the top right is trachea lining, and this consists of those mucus secreting goblet cells, which are brown. I bet you really thought you were done with histology and anatomy one, didn't you? Um, the red portions there is ciliated epithelium, and you can almost kind of picture those flowing back and forth and sweeping the mucus out. The respiratory system consists of those passages that help to filter air coming in, transport it into the body to the lungs, and where we can have some gas exchange at the microscopic air sacs called alveoli. We want to take in the oxygen and get rid of the carbon dioxide. So respiration is the process of exchanging gases between the atmosphere and body cells. It has five events. Uh, vent Ventilation is the movement of air in and out of the lungs, okay, called commonly breathing. Um, external respiration is exchange of gases between the air in the lungs and the blood. Transport of gases by the blood occurs between the lungs and the body cells. Uh, exchange of gases between the blood and body cells is what we call internal respiration. And then lastly, um, oxygen is used and the production of carbon dioxide occurs as a byproduct of cellular respiration, which we know is vitally important because that is where we get ATP for all of our body cells and all of our metabolic activities. So cellular respiration allows us to take energy from the chemical bonds of nutrients by removing electrons. We send those on to the electron transport chain to bind with oxygen. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor, and then we are able to make ATP. So why do we do respiration? Okay, why do we breathe? And most people, when I ask that question, I say, why do you breathe? And people will say, well, so we don't die. <laughs> All right, well, why? Why would you die if you didn't do cellular respiration? And that is tied to, I mean, if you didn't breathe, uh, that is tied to the fact that if you don't breathe, you don't have oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, you can't do cellular respiration. So we have respiration as an organism, and then we have cellular respiration on a cell level. Okay. And so gas exchange occurs at the cellular and the molecular level and on the whole organism level. Um, aerobic respirations are reactions in cellular respiration that allow for us to make ATP. We have carbon dioxide produced as a waste product that forms it with water to make carbonic acid, which helps maintain the blood blood pH. So it's also important for uh, keeping that internal pH environment in the right, at the right level for homeostasis. Too much carbon dioxide decreases pH too much, so the respiratory system must remove enough carbon dioxide to balance that pH. All right, so the organs of the respiratory system can be divided into two general tracts. We have the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract includes the nose, nasal cavity, sinuses, and pharynx. We also take in air through our mouth. Uh, <clears throat> one thing to point out is a lot, I see a lot of people walking around the stores, uh, you know, dur during Due to COVID right now, we're all supposed to be wearing masks. And I see a lot of people walking around with the mask right here, which I kind of understand because it does fog up your glasses if you wear it properly, which is over the nose. But I wonder, do they understand that that is part of the respiratory system? And if you don't cover both, you're not doing any good. So the lower respiratory tract includes things like the larynx, the trachea, the bronchial tree, and the lungs. So the nasal cavity is a hollow space located right behind the nose between the hard palate and the cribriform plates. The hard palate you can see is right here. 
It's separated by the nasal septum. We have nasal concha that support the mucous membranes that line the nasal cavity, help increase its surface area. The mucous membrane in the, uh, that lines the nasal ca cavity warms the air that comes in um, and traps dust. It keeps things moist and it's what ha it works kind of like a filter. Uh, that mucous membrane has the pseudostratified ciliated epithelium. So that means it has cilia. So when the mucus trap foreign invaders, the cilia can sweep it out. A pet peeve of mine is when I hear people come in and complain and say, oh, I have sinuses. And I just kind of want to correct them and say, goodness, I hope you do. Uh, because a sinus is just an air-filled space and is located in frontal, maxillary, uh, sphenoid, and the ethmoid bones of the skull. And so we have several locations. If you don't have that opening, then there is something very wrong. And so don't come to class and say, I have sinuses. You can say, I have a sinus infection, or you can say, my sinuses are irritated, or my sinuses are killing me. But please don't say, I have sinuses, unless you are labeling that on your lab exam. Anyway, so the mucous membrane lines it and it's kind of it goes along continuously with the lining of the nasal cavity and sinuses act to reduce the weight of the skull and they also uh, serve for resonance. So our resonance in voice cha chambers and this is something that singers can take advantage of and we have what we call our head voice and we resonate through those chambers or our chest voice and we resonate a little bit lower. So that's just kind of an interesting point there. All right, so the pharynx is just behind the oral cavity and between the nasal cavity and the larynx. And we have three sections of this here. We have the nasopharynx, which is the upper portion. So think nasal, uh, naso nose. And so it's almost, you can see, um, just below the bottom of the nose. And then we have the oropharynx, oro, think oral. So it is situated almost or just below the mouth, almost at the same angle there. And then, then we have the laryngopharynx, which is going to be at the bottom, um, going to be situated, this one just a little bit above the larynx here. Um, so this is a passageway for food moving from the oral cavity to the esophagus and for air passing between the nasal cavity and the larynx. So the larynx is a passageway for air moving in and out of the trachea. It prevents foreign objects from entering the trachea. It also houses the vocal cords. So this is where we actually form our speech, or where the sound comes out, I should say. So the largest of the cartilages here are going to be the thyroid. We have three that are single, and we have three that are paired. So we have the thyroid, the cricoid, and then the epiglottic, and that is actually kind of part of the flap, like an epi epiglottis. These are made primarily of hyaline cartilage, so they're very strong. Um, like I said, these are single structures. Uh, they're a rotenoid, carniculate, and cuneiform cartilages are paired, and so we have one on either side. So we have a cartilaginous structure at the base of the tongue, and it helps to prevent food and liquid from entering the trachea when we swallow. The thyroid cartilage is actually covered by the thyroid, and it kind of has the same kind of a shape there as the thyroid. Cricoid is just behind or inferior uh, to the thyroid cartilage, and it marks the lowest portion of the larynx, so that's important. Okay, that's the lowest portion of the larynx. The epiglottic part cartilage is the only one that is made of elastic cartilage instead of hyaline cartilage. And this is the uh, central part of the epiglottis. Now you can see a better, you can get a better look at this diagram in your textbook. Um, the epiglottis allows air to enter the larynx and closes whenever you swallow. And that covers the opening of the larynx, preventing the food from getting in. Okay, I may have already told you that. Um, three posterior cartilages, those are going to be attachments for the muscles and they aid in speech and the uh, larynx closing. Okay, and so these are important. They're kind of hard to remember. For lab, I would really recommend that you draw these out a few times and label them. That's going to help you find something that helps you remember them. So the larynx has two horizontal folds that are made of muscle and connective tissue. These are what we call the false vocal cords and the true vocal cords. You can see here, let's go with this color, 
here is the false vocal cord. So it's this function here, and it's kind of hard to see these on this picture. So you might want to look a little closer in your text. And then the true vocal cords are down there a little bit lower. So opening between those vocal cords is what is called the glottis. Um, so upper folds of the larynx are the false vocal cords. They do not produce any sound. So that's why we call them false. The lower folds are the ones that actually produce true vocal sounds. They're made of elastic fibers. They produce, produce sound whenever air is forced between the folds and it causes vibrations. The trachea, which we call the windpipe commonly, now don't put windpipe on your test, call it a trachea, uh, is the cylindrical tube here. Uh, it is flexible but yet rigid enough to be very tough because it is made out of cartilage. It extends downward anterior to the esophagus, so it's in front of the esophagus, uh, into the thoracic cavity, and then splits as it goes into the right and left pulmonary bronchi. The inner wall of the trachea is lined with ciliated mucous membranes that has many, many goblet cells. This membrane continues to clean the incoming air and to move intrapped particles upward into the pharynx where mucus can be swallowed. Um, the respiratory tubes branch out and become smaller in diameter, and you can see it almost looks like an upside down tree and the branches getting thinner and thinner and thinner. The epithelial lining changes from that pseudostratified and ciliated columnar to cuboidal and simple squamous epithelium. The trachea membrane has um, C-shaped cartilage rings, about 20 of them, and those are the passageways for air. These are made of hyaline cartilage and prevent collapsing and blockage of the airway. And so that ciliated mucous membrane, uh, that, that structure is important. Uh, the mucus uh, traps foreign invaders as they come in, and the cilia helps to expel that mucus. And then the fact that it is made of cartilage, which makes it strong and yet flexible, that is also really important to the functioning of these. So this is a clinical application here of a tracheotomy. A blocked trachea can cause asphyxiation or suffocation in minutes. If the tissues are swollen, if you have excess secretion or a foreign object that obstructs the trachea, um, we're going to make a temporary, a doctor will make a temporary um, incision um, externally in the tube so that air can bypass that obstruction and save the life. So you can see the location of that instruction is right there. All right, and so this is done in a life-saving situation by a licensed medical professional, tracheostomy, and it allows them to breathe. Now we know cartilage doesn't heal very well, so this is, is it only done in extreme uh, situations. Here we're looking at the bronchial tree. This is the tree of branched airways. As I said, it looks kind of like an up-down tree uh, that leads from the trachea all the way to the alveoli, which are the microscopic air sacs. Each primary bronchus leads from the trachea to enter to a lung. And as you can see here, as they get more narrow, as they get smaller, the name changes, as true as, as uh, we see in our cardiovascular unit, many of the vessels. So we have the right primary bronchus and as it begins to uh, narrow down and this is right here then it branches off and that becomes the secondary bronchus and then as that branches even further that becomes the tertiary bronchus um, we also have the terminal bronchial which of course terminal means it is going to be uh, at the end all right, so each bronchus is accompanied by large blood vessels as it enters the respective lung. If you wanted to examine the trachea and bronchial tree, the procedure to do that would be using an instrument called a bronchoscopy. That would be the procedure name, sorry. Here we're getting a good close-up look at the alveoli, and this is where gas exchange occurs. So this is vitally important. You can see the alveoli are little sacs there, uh, and these are surrounded by these capillary networks up here. You can see those capillary networks that can pick up oxygen or drop off carbon dioxide. And so this is a nice microscopic view here. You can see the alveoli and those capillaries as well. 
We're kind of covered most of this, but the structure of the bronchus is similar to that of the trachea, except the C-shaped cartilaginous rings are replaced with cartilaginous plates, where each main bronchus branches. And then it's going to branch, and it's going to become more and more narrow, and the amount is going to uh, amount of cartilage is going to uh, dis uh, decrease until it disappears on down into the bronchioles. All right. Um, at the same time, smooth muscle is beginning to become more prominent and uh, then will begin to diminish as you get down to the bronchioles all the way down to the alveolar line, which is the smallest uh, portion. So alveoli, again, uh, provide increased surface area, and this is important to maximize the amount of gas exchange that we're able to do. Oxygen is going to diffuse in through the alveolar wa uh, walls to enter the blood, and carbon dioxide is going to diffuse out. So we're going to have oxygen going in here and carbon dioxide being dropped off there. So the right and left lungs are soft, spongy organs where they are situated in the thoracic uh, cavity, which is separated by the heart and the mediastinum. Uh, one really important note here is to notice that the right lung has three lobes and the uh, left lung has only two lobes. And then of course remember that you look at your patient's right and left. So the bronchus and blood vessels enter the lung through the hilum, remember, and the hilum is just an opening that allows them to come through. The visceral and parietal pleural membranes are normally held together by a thin film of serous fluid. A layer of serous membrane, which is the visceral pleura, is firmly attached to the surface of each lung. Remember that visceral is always the closest to the organ. This membrane folds back at the hilum and then it becomes the parietal pleura. The parietal pleura uh, is then going to form part of the medias mediastinum and line the inner wall of the thoracic cavity. So you can see here the parietal pleura is what's highlighted here in green, okay? And so inside that where it folds back, that is the pleural cavity. Uh, so the parietal, fl fl uh, hmm, parietal pleura forms part of the mediastinum, lines the inner wall of the thoracic cavity. The space between the visceral, so the visceral is going to be the more innermost layer here, okay? So visceral on the inside and then parietal on the outside and then the space in between those is the cavity. Uh, this contains the serous fluid in the cavity that helps to lubricate and uh, reduce friction. If you have ever had pleurisy, you know that that is important because every breath when you breathe with pleurisy is painful and if it's bad enough it hurts even when you're not breathing. Okay, so as the rib cage expands, the parietal takes the visceral along with it, which helps the lungs expand. That's another reason why if you have pleurisy, which is the irritation of the pleura, uh, that when you take in a breath is why it hurts so much then because you're actually moving the membranes that are irritated. So we're going to look more at how we actually breathe. What is the anatomy of the actually how does it change as we are breathing that allows us to intake the air? It might be different than what you think it is. Breathing or ventilation, that's the movement of air from outside of the body, into the body, up through the alveoli, into the bronchial tree. Uh, the actions that are responsible for these are known as inhalation, which we call inspiration in anatomy, and exhalation, which we call expiration. All right, so inhalation, you breathe in. Exhalation, you breathe out. So if I asked you what you were doing when you breathed in, answer that question for me. What happens when you breathe in? Did you say that you suck air in? Because that is wrong. This actually, what happens is you're expanding the volume and you're creating a difference in pressure and then that allows air to flow in along the pressure gradient. So we're gonna look at that along in the next few slides. All right, so if we don't suck air into our lungs, how does the air get in? It's really basic physical science, honestly. Um, this has to do with Boyle's law. Pressure and volume, Boyle's law tells us that pressure and volume of a gas are inversely related. That means um, as volume increases, let's see where I can write this, if volume 
increases, then pressure decreases. All right. And so what happens as we expand our lungs, we are increasing the volume. The volume is getting bigger. So let's say these lungs here, um, right there, they're at rest. This equal pressure inside and outside of the lung, so there is no net movement in or out. Okay. We've talked about pressure gradients before, or gradients before, where you're moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. Air is going to do the same thing due to differences in pressure. So if I take these lungs and I expand my lungs and make them bigger, all right, pressure is force over force over area, all right? So what is the gases are applying pressure to the walls of my lungs right here? And so if I increase the area, then those gas molecules, instead of traveling this far, they have to travel that far. And so it's going to decrease the amount of force, okay? Because I have the same number of gas molecules. And so that then is going to cause a decrease in pressure. So I increase the volume of the lungs and I decrease the amount of pressure. So now I have a pressure difference. I have created a pressure gradient. The pressure outside my lungs is higher than the pressure inside my lungs. And so air is going to flow into my lungs. So the first event in inspiration is one number one. The diaphragm, what is it going to do? Most people want to say diaphragm moves up because we that's what we're feeling, but it doesn't. The diaphragm moves downward. Pay attention because I see this missed a lot on the test. So number one, the diaphragm moves downward as those external intercostal muscles contract. Okay, This increases the volume of the lung. So we've got the diaphragm moving down. Okay, increases the volume of the lungs. And if we increase the volume of the lungs, then we decrease the pressure in the lungs. Okay, the thoracic cavity expands. As volume increases, pressure inside the lungs becomes lower than the pressure outside of the lungs because atmospheric pressure is greater forcing air into the lungs. This is also known as negative pressure ventilation, negative pressure into ventilation, and this will uh, continue until an equilibrium is really uh, reached. When we take a deep breath, really deep, okay, this is max, maximal inspiration, that's what's occurring. That's through forcing the diaphragm and in intercostal muscles to contract more forcefully than when we are just normally breathing. So how easy is it to expand lungs in relationship to the pressure? Uh, how easy that is during breathing, we call that compliance. Compliance. Um, you can have conditions that obstruct air passages. They can destroy lung tissue or impede your lung expansion in other ways, and those will decrease compliance. And so that is something we talk about when we are looking uh, at people that are having issues with breathing. What is their compliance? This is a little more detailed uh, list here uh, that includes the uh, nerve innervation of the phrenic nerves, getting, uh, getting impulses to muscle fibers in the diaphragm, which causes contraction. Then the diaphragm moves, moves downward, thoracic cavity expands, external intercostal muscles contract, raising the ribs up and expand the thoracic cavity even further. The intraalveolar pressure decreases, atmospheric pressure is greater than the intraalveolar pressure, air is forced into the respiratory tract through the air passages and the lungs fill with air.